Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Sinai Temple in Los Angeles, California. We are uh, so excited to uh, be joined by my good friend, once my uh, foe. And we'll talk about why that's the case in a few moments. Uh, Mike Sweetney, um, give me one second. If you are watching on Facebook, you can uh, Facebook Live, make sure to share it with your friends. If you're watching on YouTube, welcome. Um, we are going to talk today about religion, about basketball, about Israel, and also about some mental health as well. Um, so we're going to welcome in Mike Sweetney. Mike, how you doing? Unmute there. I'm doing, yeah, yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. How about you guys? Very well, very well. Thanks for uh, joining us, three o'clock on the East Coast. Um, yeah. Usually, Mike actually is about to get on the plane and come out to Los Angeles. Uh, he came out here for our Sinai Temple basketball camp, and I'm going to go. Um, First to how we actually met, I'm going to share a little history of uh, those of you who know me. I'm a passionate basketball fan, specifically college basketball. Growing up in Syracuse, New York, where the Syracuse Orange basketball team were like our Los Angeles Lakers. The New York Yankee Red Sox rivalry, the Lakers Celtics, that was Syracuse Georgetown. You have it in your blood to um, not like the Georgetown Hoya. Um, but with that said, uh, just about last year, uh, at about this time, I read an article in the Jewish News Service that said Mike Sweetney, the former Georgetown Hoya and ninth pick in the 2003 NBA draft, right behind Le LeBron James, Carmelo Anthony, Chris Bosh, Dwayne Wade, the ninth pick. He said this article said that he had just returned from the state of Israel and he was a transformed person. And at the end of the article, it gave his email. And I said, I'm going to reach out. And I reached out to Mike Sweetney. And I said, I'd love for you to come to California, to Los Angeles, to Sinai Temple basketball camp. And he said, I would love to, but I'm a little busy right now because I got to go to Camp Ramah in the Poconos. And I said, what is that about? And then we began a wonderful conversation, relationship. Mike came out here. He spent Shabbat at Sinai Temple. He's uh, very fluent in the practices of Shabbat. Um, and actually this year, right before this pandemic began, or as it was beginning, Mike Sweetney joined us at um, the APAC Policy Conference to support the U.S.-Israel relationship. So we're going to welcome uh, Mike uh, to the Sinai Temple virtual community today. And uh, we're going to begin first, maybe just tell us a little bit, let's go back before Georgetown um, to your journey um, living outside Washington, D.C., and what basketball meant to you and how, how you uh, came into the basketball world. Yeah, awesome. So um, I'm from, um, you know, Oxon Hill, Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I was introduced to the game of basketball at, uh, what, nine years old by my father. Um, he you know, had a passion for the game of basketball and I didn't like it at first, but he wanted to keep me busy. And um, he introduced me to the game of basketball. And I'm so grateful for it to this day because basketball pretty much, you know, changed my life. And um, so many opportunities came from, you know, about it. Um, it was, you know, All-American in high school basketball. I was able to attend Georgetown University on a um, four-year scholarship. And a lot of people don't know this, but um, I committed to Georgetown my freshman after my freshman year of high school. Yeah, you took my spot, actually. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, <laughs> take any, um, I didn't take any other visits or anything. Once they came and said, hey, we want you to come play there, I was like, cool. So people thought it was the dumbest decision ever you know, to not even you know, take a meeting or visit another school. But I was like, hey, it's once a lifetime opportunity. Um, make the best of it. And I'm, you know, so my rest of my three years of high school was very comfortable because I knew where I was going to be. Maybe share that story. I think it was uh, when John Thompson came in the ninth yeah. grade and we brought in the room. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So um, I went to, uh, I was at a high school. I had my, one of my high school games and John Thompson came to the gym and I was kind of naive, didn't know. So I was like, what is John Thompson doing here? I thought he was there seeing somebody else. And um, after the game, my father was like, hey, uh, John Thompson's here for you. And I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He said, so tomorrow you have to go down to, um, you know, to the school and meet. So I was like, whoa, okay, cool. So we're down there, we're having a meeting and, um, uh, you know, he was like, John Thomas was like, hey, you know, we'd love for you to come here. We have, you know, we believe in you. Feel like you can be, a, you know, one of the all-time greats to Georgetown. It'd be good. And, uh, you know, someone would like, like to meet you and see if you want to come. And um, for me, typical, I mean, that was smart when they part. So in walks, I guess Patrick Newman was like in town working out. So Patrick Newman comes inside the meeting and he was like, hey, you know, how you doing, Mike? We'd love to have you. And back in my mind, I'm like, Patrick Newman knows my name? Wow. So I was like, yeah, I'm coming to Georgetown. <laughs> So my father was like, whoa, not too fast. Like, you know, because I guess he was like, you know, let's wait to hear it. Right away, I was like, yeah, I'm committing. I'm coming to Georgetown. 
So just, you know, that fact having Patrick knew my name and wanted me to come to the school. And I was like, you know, he's the one, Patrick Alonzo, the Kimbe, those guys are people that I watched on TV. So for them to say, hey, come to where we play college basketball, it was like a no brainer for me. Actually, I just saw Patrick Ewing was recovering from the coronavirus. So we just want to yeah. send our good wishes to him and to uh, his family as well. Um, sure. So let's jump to college um, because you were literally just an amazing, amazing player. I'm just going to read something here that I looked up as you uh, ruined my night on March 4th, 2003. This is from the Syracuse Post Standard. It said, Mike Sweetney, 6'8", 260 pound forward, typified Georgetown's brute force. It said, Monday's game was not for the timid. Scored 32 points and 13 rebounds, 15 points in the game's first 12 minutes. I, number one, let's uh, share if you remember that moment and maybe a good Syracuse Georgetown memory. But then I really want to get into how do you know at a high level, and this is not just for sports, but I think for any type of profession, how do you know when you are at the level of being the best and you can take it to that next level? So go back to that Syracuse game and then let's take it from there. So it's funny you say that. Um, so with that Syracuse game, so I never a lot of people don't know the story. My wife knows it. Uh, what happened was that um, that summer I played on the USA team, USA team, and Jim Beheim was one of the coaches. He was a coach, and he didn't play me at all. And I clearly, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's when I knew the Georgetown Syracuse rivalry was real. Um, you know, we were going to win the tournament anyway, but the fact that he didn't play me at all, we'll be we'll be up by like thirty points. He would not put me in the game. And I'm glad he stuck this. by his morals and principles. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, you know, I probably did the same thing. So, but um, I took yeah. it personal. I said, okay, so we play just every time we play Syracuse, I'm going to give, I'm, I'm going to give them all I have because I'm going to let him be, no, he made a mistake. I didn't play me. So surely after three times we played them, I had 30 points every single game. So it was, um, it was definitely personal for me. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun with it. Um, so yeah. That's, that's, now, how that's do you know I'm at the high level? I mean, you're scoring 32 points in the major college game. You're, you know, becoming all American three years. And how do you realize, like, you know what? I'm ready to go to the NBA. I'm ready to be successful. I'm ready to take that step, if you wish. Some people call it a leap. Um, what was that moment that you realized I'm going to go play with the best? Um, weirdly, uh, so that moment kind of happened. Cause I think when I, when I was playing on the court, I was so just felt like I was, you know, with everybody else. Of course, I knew I had good numbers, but like. The NBA, I wasn't so sure. You know, I just didn't know. You know, I didn't know. I never had an agent approach me or a runner to say, hey, come in NBA, you can do X, Y, and Z. And so what happened was um, uh, with my roommate, he was like really always online and doing through computers and stuff like that. So what happened was he showed me something online and he was like, hey, um, you see this right here? You're, you're going to be a top 10 pick. I guess it was like the mock draft. <laughs> so I was like, really? This is like my dream year. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, man, you, you can go to the NBA and be a top 10 pick. I was like, are you sure that's real? So he started showing me like different websites. I was like, wow, this is real. And I had you always with, trust everything on the internet, right? Yeah. yeah it just <laughs> it's sense. crazy. <laughs> and um, so I had a conversation with my father about it. I was like, hey, you see this? And he said the same thing. He's like, you can't trust anything you read. You don't, you don't know that for sure. You know, you got to go try out. You, know, you don't know. So I was like, but no, the fact that I mentioned it, I think I might give it a try. And he was like, hey, I'm support whatever you want to do. And, um, you know, kind of you know, once I started talking to people and I kind of let Georgetown know what my decision, my decision to think about going to the NBA. And just when everybody, once that, once I said I, I wanted to give it a try, the floodgates open with agents and people contact me and everything. That's I was like, wow, this is real. I really accomplished something big. So that was right there, like my moment when my roommate showed me that. That was my aha. I'm like, wow, I really had a chance to, like, you know, really do this. So I know that uh, you just mentioned your father several times in that story. And I know your dad was such a powerful influence and inspiration in your life. And I also know that that affected your um, journey ahead. Um, tell us first about your dad's influence before that aspect, and then take us, if you may, um, towards training camp with the New York Knicks yeah. and what happened at that moment. So, like I said before, my father was the person that introduced me to the game at eight years old. Um, growing up, my father, this is no exaggeration, my father never missed a practice, never missed a game. He was always there, you know, with good criticism, bad criticism. He was always just there to be that person that just be, you know, like, do the good support system. And um, so college, you know, I would pick up the phone after every game and talk to him. High school, same thing. You know, rides home from the game, he would tell me goods and bad. He was like literally my, my best friend. And um, so after I got drafted, um, I went to go play in the NBA Summer League. And that was, a, you know, an amazing experience. And my father, he, was, he wasn't able to make that, but he was able to watch the games on TV. And uh, he saw me, he saw me play Summer League. And then right before my rookie year, 
with the Knicks. My father, like two days, a couple days before training camp, I got a call that my father had passed away from a massive heart attack. I had just talked to him. And next thing you know, he was gone. And that kind of like, you know, shook my world. It was one of those things where, you know, he was a person introducing to the game. He was my best friend. My, he was my everything. You know, he was like my reason to keep pushing. And losing him and, go, and then having to, you know, literally have the funeral and then two days later go into a training camp probably one of the hardest decisions. I try to use basketball as my outlet, but didn't go as planned. So how does that look like in terms of the public figure? I just saw a video last night of the draft that it was the only time that the New York Knicks actually, the fans applauded a draft pick <laughs> every time they're booing. All of a sudden yeah. you're, and somebody said, you know, a, a billboard in Times Square. And here you are, this public personality, but privately really dealing with the real sense of loss and grief. What does that look like on a day-to-day basis going through that experience? Uh, it was horrible. I felt like trying to live. I was like two people. You know, I was, I would be in public, smiling, joking, and practice like, oh, everything is fine. But then behind closed doors at home, I'm a mess. I'm depressed. You know, I'm crying. And I'm upset. I'm mad at the world. I'm not taking care of myself. It was just one of those things. Like, I was trying to juggle two people. And it just it kind of took its toll. It took its toll on me. And it was one of those things. Like you said, I had everything. It was you know, and then, you know, like I said, being in New York City on, you know, being on a billboard. And I tell people to this day, I was on a billboard in Times Square and I wasn't even excited or I felt nothing. I was like, oh, I'm in Times Square. Okay, cool. Now I'm like, wow, that was pretty cool. But at that time, I felt nothing. Mm-hmm. And it was just weird. Like, wow, that's when I knew that that was, I'm in a really, really horrible place. And when did you realize that this was a situation where perhaps, you know, you needed assistance from mental health? What did that look like in the NBA and professional sports? And perhaps does that look a little different now um, in professional sports? I think, I think for me, when I knew it was a problem when we were in Cleveland and uh, I was just kind of had it in. I was tired. You know, I was tired of trying to be two people, um, tired of, you know, the things were, you know written about me. I was just tired. And um, I tried to take, you know, try to take a bottle of pills to par myself. And that's when I knew this was real and I got a real problem. I'm like, wow, I woke up the next morning. Like, I really try to do this to myself. And I still didn't tell anybody. I hit it. I was like, there's no way I'm going to tell nobody what happened. And uh, so it took me about five, six years after that to really accept what happened and really get the right kind of help that I needed. And, um, you know, luckily I got this job overseas that helped me you know, recover because um, I couldn't, for whatever reason, I couldn't recover in the States, um, I guess, because I had too many traumas. You know, everywhere mm-hmm. I went, people were asking about the Knicks and the Bulls and what happened to your NBA career. Like, everywhere I went, it always happened. And mm-hmm. so I needed just to get away and, you know, accept that my father was gone, accept that my NBA career was over and how to, you know, hit that reset button. And that was much needed. I mean, much change. Pretty much that, me going to Uruguay, South America, like, saved my life. And then let's mm-hmm. transfer or uh, transition a little to our mutual acquaintance, Tamir Goodman. Tamir mm-hmm. Goodman in the year 2000, when I graduated high school, that's also when you graduated high school, right? Yep. Um, we're uh, known as the Jewish Jordan, an Orthodox high school basketball player who committed to a large university, University of Maryland, for uh, different reasons. He ended up playing at Towson, playing professionally overseas, and does amazing things in Israel. Let's uh, share how you first met Tamir Goodman um, back in the high school days, and then how did he reconnect? And also, when I saw that article, it was called Mike Sweetney, Life on the Rebound. How did Tamir uh, add to this process of uh, recovering from this mental health crisis? Um, Tamir was so amazing because um, we, we met um, our senior years in high school. We were playing in a you know, basketball all-star game called the Capital Classic, where the D.C. All-Stars played against the nation's all-stars, and Tamir was my teammate. Uh-huh. And one day... Um, in practice, uh, coach said everybody, you know, get a part and go shoot. And um, Tamir was kind of, I guess I wouldn't say it was jealousy, but it was like a lot of guys kind of, you know, wasn't too sure about him because, you know, he was, because Tamir, you know, we worked so hard, but Tamir was just that guy. He was the, you know, sports illustrator. That's something that all the guys wanted. So guys kind of treated him a certain way or they were kind of jealous. And for me, coach said, let's go shoot. I was like, all right, Tamir, let's go shoot. And I didn't care about that stuff. I just saw him as just a person. I didn't care about the, Sports Illustrated, you know, him wearing a yarmulke. I didn't look at him any type of differently. And I think he was kind of weirded out at first about it. He was like, why do you acting so normal to him? And I was like, you know, we start talking about life and shooting, and we kind of just hit it off from there. And um, even then, he don't know this, but even during the times where I was going through my depression, you know, after the NBA, like, to me, we're always just sending messages, checking in. I don't think he knew. But it was just this weird connection that I guess, you know, he was pushed to do that. 
he would always just be one of those people that would just say, hey, how you doing, checking in. And we just always stayed in contact. And then um, as the years grown, our relationship grew even more. Once, you know, once I, you know, he knew about what I was going through. He was like, well, I never knew you were going through all that. And uh, our, our relationship grew. And once he left from the States to go to Israel, that's when he gave me Camp Ramah. And that's when our relationship went to a whole nother level. <laughs> so go back to uh, growing up on Oxen Hill outside of D.C. What did you know about the Jewish community, the Washington, Maryland era, it's area full of very uh, vibrant Jewish community. What was your experience in the African-American community of the Jewish community? Maybe some, if you wish, stereotypes so, that you heard or no, saw? So, so this is crazy. I, I don't mean to be, sound horrible. No, I no, never, no. And, until, until my senior high school, that was my first senior year. I saw him on TV, but he was the first Jewish person I ever saw in person. My senior mm-hmm. high school, so at age 17. So meeting him was the first time I ever saw a Jewish person and for me. I didn't have any stereotypes about it. You know what I'm saying? It was one of those things where only thing that I knew that, you know, the, the you know, the dress, you know, I knew that the, you know, they were the, you know, the I forgot what, what do you call the black hats? Oh. There's a special name. Oh, it's like the well, keeper, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So at the time, um, my stereotype was that they all wore the long black suits and stuff like that. So when I saw him dress like that, that was the only stereotype I was like, oh, why is he not dressed like that? And uh-huh. I just now, what, four, three or four years ago, I'm learning all the different levels of the Jewish religion and everything like that, and how everything goes apart. So I was like, oh, so that was the only stereotype that I had. You know, like, why isn't Tamir wearing, you know, all that? But that's when we got learned. But, the, you know, for me, I didn't, that was my first time. I never experienced it. So until I met him at 17, and at Georgetown, I ran a couple, I met a couple of Jewish kids there, um, and you know, in passing, but yeah, nothing. Yeah, that was it. So, so all of a sudden you become friends with Tamir. Tamir's like, I'm going to Israel. He tells you, uh, Mike, you're going to Camp Ramah. Were you like, what is that? And uh, how, how did that work driving up to the Poconos and all of a sudden seeing like, what did I so, just get myself into? So that was my reaction. So when he first told me, I was like, oh yeah, no brainer for sure. And then it hit me as I was going, I was like, wow, am I really about to go out here? So I was like, I was so nervous. I was like, I didn't know how it was going. I was like, well, I know they're going to realize I'm not Jewish. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> so I was like, how is this about to be? I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to be perceived. You know, I didn't know, you know, as far as, you know, I knew I was going to be accepted. I knew for me it didn't matter, but I didn't know how me and my kids would be accepted. And when I got there. That's important to say, Mike also brought his family to Camp Ramada. Yeah, so I brought my, my wife and kids up there. So when I got there, as soon as I got there, um, I met a lady named Amy. Amy was like, she was like the art teacher there. At Ramah. And when I got there, me was like, oh, these are your kids? I was like, yeah. Okay, let them, I got them. Everyone has, everyone has some fun. So I'm like, what, what, what you mean? Take my kids. So they like took my three kids. <laughs> and they, and I was just like, what's happening? Like, what is happening? And everybody was just so nice and so welcome. And I'm like, what is happening here right now? And like, my kids had the time they life. Um, the community was so opening, so welcoming. I was just like, wow. I was not expecting it. So right away, that nervousness I felt went away instantly. Because I was like, wow, just nothing but love and just so, you know, people just, you know, sincerely. It was amazing. And what was the, what was that first Shabbat experience like with, you know, 500 kids <laughs> away from their parents in the Chader Ochel in the dining hall? You're like, why are they pounding on the tables? What are they singing? Tell us about your, was that your first Shabbat experience? Yeah. What was that like? Um, I think for me and my wife and my kids, I think for all of us, we were just like staring, you know, not in a bad way. We were just trying yeah. to understand it, learn. And my, you know, for my kids, it was like, like, what is happening? Like, why are they singing? Why are they pounding on table? Because like we teach our kids, look, don't yeah. be on table, don't be so like they're like, oh, so it is okay. They were just trying to understand this, you know, everything about the culture. And you know, for me, it was just a it was a life, you know, great learning experience. And uh, I've learned so much about it. And it was, it was it was a great, you know, great meal. We're actually hoping to get you up to Camper Mon, Ojai, California this summer, but God willing, uh, one time soon we're gonna get you up there as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> so then let's talk about the Israel experience. All of a sudden, Tamir takes you to Camp Ramah. You see the Shabbat experience. Our first phone yeah. call, you were like, <laughs> I remember you called me on the way home. Like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, sorry. Uh, I, you know, I was getting ready for Shabbat. I didn't expect that from that phone call. <laughs> so when does Tamir call you? And he's like, look, Mike, we're taking the next step. We're going to Israel. How did that work? Okay. Oh, so real quick before they I mean, get to yeah. that question. So whenever I talk, because I've been to since then, I've been to countless Shabbat dinners. If I tell my kids they had a choice to go to a Shabbat dinner or go to the park and play, Shabbat dinner by far. <laughs> they love it. They they enjoy it. They love the holiday. They, they always eat. They're embarrassed because they always eat almost a whole loaf of holly bread by themselves. 
it's so embarrassing, but they just love okay, Shabbat dinners. Good. They love what it brings. But um, just the um, the sort of going to Israel, um, Tamir said, hey, I have a basketball camp. Can you come out here to Israel? And I'm like, all right, cool. For once again, no brain. All right, cool. Then my wife was like, um, do you watch the news? Do you know what's happening in Israel? Like, you can you might have to check in with the embassy because you might, you know, you might get a bomb. And it was just like all the stuff. So I'm like, is it really like that over there? Like, so I'm start reading stuff. I'm seeing stuff. I'm like, wow, this I'm really about to go into. So in my mind, I'm like, I'm about to go into a war zone. Like, what is happening? And um, so I'm getting over there and I'm like, wow. I was just wow, like off the break. Um, everybody, like I said, one it was like similar to camp. Everybody was so nice, it was so peaceful over there. And you know, nine, ten o'clock at night, kids outside playing by themselves, you know, kids walk to the store by themselves. Um, so that right there alone just shocked me because even here, I'm not letting my kids go to the park by themselves. They're not walking to the store by themselves, mm-hmm. you know. And it's just like, you know, it's like now I told myself, like, what is more safe? You know, you, it's like you're more safe over there than you are here. You can't let your kids do those things. And in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep because I was still on East Coast time. I would just take a walk around, you know, around the Western Wall and just take a walk through Israel by myself in the middle of the night. Nobody bothered me. I always have people who would wave like, hey, hello. I guess they probably just thought I was a, somebody famous, but everybody was just so welcoming. So for me, it was an amazing experience with the food, the people, the culture, the the religious part. I learned so much about, you know, not only just the Christianity, but, you know, Judaism. I, I just learned a lot about them. And just visiting the Western Wall, just that I've always heard if you go there, always so spiritual. I'm like, is it really that? Like, is it just an experience? And like, and I got there, you felt it. So um, just the things I saw in the Bible, you see those signs, like, wow, this is what I read in the Bible and I'm here. So it was a life-changing experience. It was amazing. So what did you bring back from that trip to um your own personal life and then I want to talk about the journey that you have entered into the Jewish community as a whole within the sports and really combine those aspects um for my own personal life um I think I just just the the this me going there and praying on the western wall and I had this sense because I had you know always had so much going on in life whether it's good or bad and I just had this sense of like everything is going to be okay you know just keep pushing forward no matter what it is just keep pushing forward and just you know keep believing in God and and just try to live life right. And I just watch people there, whereas, you know, family and friends, I don't I think for me being there for a whole week, there's no lie. I think I've never seen anybody have a disagreement with each other. Like everybody was just getting along. So I'm like, is this- You went to the life? wrong neighborhoods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just, um, just, and also we'll rewind real quick. So about the other thing when I got there, um, I saw Jews and Muslims mm-hmm. interacting with each other that's, all, I'm not, that's so important. I don't know how to mention that. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw Jews and Muslims getting along, talking like normal people, like how I many you have a conversation. Right. And from what I was told before I got there, like if a Jew and a Muslim cross paths, it's going to end bad. I'm not saying 100% of them is bad. I'm sure right. it's some right. ways, you know, whatever, right. but watching them interacting, going to the same stores and walking past each other, talking like they're normal, that blew my mind. I'm like, wow. Mm-hmm. You know what you see on the news and newspaper is totally not true. This is a very peaceful place, so I, I've got to tell you that part. Oh, so. that's important. I think uh, I, I always say show and tell is the best way to learn. And I mean, mm-hmm. for you to, for sure. you know, take that leap of faith if you wish to Israel. And then that article came out, and I emailed you. I remember emailing you saying, "Like, I'm not a crazy person. I promise." I here are my references <laughs> so that you'll actually email me back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and you emailed me back, and we and I said, "Let's come out here." Um, so then you came out here actually to Sinai Temple at our basketball camp. Um, it wasn't just a highlight. It was really an inspiring moment because it wasn't just a speech. You then came to our house. You had Shabbat dinner in our backyard. Uh, we were with Idan Ravin, NBA trainer. It was amazing. And then you got a standing ovation. We don't even get standing ovations for our sermons. When Mike spoke from the Bima, from the pulpit, um, about his experience in Israel, um, the only difficult thing about that speech was that he said the first time he uh, tasted falafel was in my driveway and not in Israel. I thought that was a difficult <laughs> comment to hear, but we'll get over that. Um, and now let's talk about the the journey that that's led you again with the Tamir Goodman uh, uh, connection, but also it was in the national news this year. All of a sudden, you get back into basketball, and this time on the coaching side. Um, tell us your journey to uh, Yeshiva University and Ramaz, um, and what that looked like this past year. So. It's interesting. So my journey there actually that happened in Israel. So um, I was in Israel with Tamir, and um, the athletic director Ellie Katz 
um, was to, his father was Samir's high school coach. Um, mm-hmm. So um, they had a great relationship. So Tamir knew him, and then he also knew Elliot Steinitz, the coach, head coach of YU. They all had good relationships. So Tamir called both of them and was like, hey, Mike, you know, back in the, living in the New York area, and he wants to coach. So both of them right away was like, yeah, no brainer. So within 30 minutes, both of those deals were just done. <laughs> so um, that's how I became coach of YU and uh, Ramaz. So what did and, you know about Yeshiva University? I'll tell you, growing up, my dad, who's a rabbi who you got to meet when he was here in L.A. in November, uh, he played basketball at Yeshiva University. And I remember I was a proud elementary school student. I would wear his Yeshiva University varsity jacket to school. And uh, even to this day, it's on his chair in his office at home in Philly. Um, yeah. What did you know about this place called Yeshiva University before you said, yes, it's a no brainer? So for me, it's one of those people I trust in here so much. Um, <laughs> if he says something that's amazing, it's good, cool. And I also, too, when I talked to Coach Elliot, he was so amazing on the phone. But the university itself, I never knew existed. Uh-huh. And once I learned about the university, I was like, wow, this is so amazing how, you know, orthodox, you know, just Jews in general can have that college experience, still keep their, you know, diet, still keep their religion, still live, you know, have a college experience and still live there, you know, stay stick to what they believe in. I think that was so amazing. And just, you know, going to that campus and just meeting a lot of the students was an amazing experience, amazing experience. Um, you know, from top to bottom, from the president of the school to anybody, like everybody was just so amazing. So um, that was just one of the experiences. That it it kind of changed my life because I met so many people through that school. Uh, the, the alumni has been amazing. Like so many people reached out, just being, you know, being a part of YU. I didn't know their, you know, they, they branch off that much. Like I didn't know how connected YU was. I'm like, how did I know, not know about this part of the world? But, uh, and what about the basketball piece? Because there's a famous, uh, a famous scene in a movie. I think it's Airplane where the uh, woman is sitting in the first class in, uh, in, in an airplane ride and asks the stewardess if she has any light reading. And the stewardess says, yes, here's a book. It's called Jews and Sports. It's light reading. There's not many pages in it. <laughs> you, get the, you ever hear that one? Yeah. Oh, you gotta see that. It's so funny, right? So take something like that, talking about stereotypes, right? And then all of a sudden you get Yeshiva University. Tell us about actually how the talent has shifted there to be a pretty high product of basketball how uh, young men are now choosing Yeshiva University over different, even Division I programs. Um, what is that looking like right now? How has that metamorphosized under Coach Steinmetz? Why are people saying, you know what, I'm going to choose Yeshiva University over being, uh, you know, a walk on at Georgetown or Syracuse? Um, I think, for instance, um, I think just, just the, the program itself, how everybody's just together. And I think for them, they're getting most of the, you know, the Jewish kids, they're able to, like I say, they're able to keep their faith able to keep their, you know, stick with the kosher diet and have a good college life. Um, I think a lot, a lot of time, especially because most kids, in order to go to college, they have to give a lot of that up. It's kind of hard for them mm-hmm. to say, okay, if I go to college, mm-hmm. you know, is it, if it's, is it hard for me to still have my same, you know, prayers, times and services and, you know, kosher diet, and I'm sure it's hard. So for them to have all that and be able to go to school, live to college, like they have basketball, it's amazing. And I think for Coach Steinitz, what is happening is what kind of, what kind of changed it was um, the kid, uh, Ryan, Ryan on our team. Um, he was a D1 recruit. <laughs> and uh, he could have went to a high division one school. Uh, maybe he went to a good, went to a good school. He had good offers. And he chose to go to Yeshiva. And people were like, hold up, you, you, you went from a D1 school to a D3 school. Like, what has happened? But Ryan believed in what why he was doing on the basketball level. And also he was able to keep, you know, stay kosher, um, you know, stay with his, um, you know, prayer services and times and, and, you know, still live his, you know, his Jewish, Jewish Orthodox life. And I think for him, he was like a no brainer. He's like, man, I'm so happy here. I'm glad I made this decision. And he's like, you know, matter if I was at the D1 school here, I'm still getting the same looks and Ryan is dominating. So a lot of these kids are seeing this. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, I have, we have, I have a kid that I played against and he was kind of highly recruited. Um, and I think he's looking at YU now because he was like, wow, like this is amazing. You know, they come to the city, they see how, Players from one through fifteen, they all play together. Nobody's selfish. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. trying to be like me. It's all about teams. It's all about winning. So, for that, it's been it's been amazing. It's, it's been amazing. Actually, I think I, all yeah. for one. I think you brought up a really important point. That's really part of my mission here. Of you know, people say, "Why are you as a rabbi doing a basketball camp? Isn't that a waste of your time?" And I said exactly what you just said. I think it's important that our exterior is able to match our interior. And it goes to what you said earlier, that when you're going through these mental health issues, 
you felt like two different people. And often people, kids and families say, you know what, I got to give up my Judaism to go play basketball, or I got to give up the basketball and I got to, you know, read the Torah all day long. And hopefully what you, what you saw here visiting, what you saw Camp Ramah, what you're seeing at Yeshiva University, what you're seeing at Tamir's camp, you can actually do both at a high level. What I have seen, at least in my uh, short experience, you know, entering the basketball and Jewish worlds together, is that when you put out that, that you believe in both of those things equally, that it gains respect of others as well. So let's go to this year for Yeshiva University. Um, you lose that first game and then all of a sudden you like sail through the entire season. Um, and then you get to the NCAA tournament where you're playing in front of no fans because the whole coronavirus and pandemic really starting. We're not really understanding what's going on. Let's back up a week when you go to your conference championship and all of a sudden you show up in Washington, D.C. at APAC. And I said, Mike, what are you doing here at APAC? You're the coach of YU and they're in the conference championship. How did you make that decision to say, I'm going to go to APAC and not go to my conference championship? So that's funny. So what happened with that situation, um, when I kind of told Coach uh, Steinmetz about it, I said, hey, um, you know, I was invited, you know, by Sinai Temple to, you know, go to APAC. Um, and, but I know the conference championship, so I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I gave him my okay, now I'm in that Rock and Harbor. He's like, are you serious right now? Are you really have to ask him that? So when he said it, I'm like, I don't know where this is going. This is a bad situation. He's like, no, you go to APAC. Like, you know, we, we got this. We'll be okay. I think we were so confident at that point that we were going to win, this, you know, our conference tournament because we sailed through the season. We sailed through the league all race. I think we were kind of confident in whatever. So he was like, hey, enjoy APAC. And I think me doing that was probably – one of the best decisions and choices of my life because, like, I, um, I learned so much, met so many people. It said a lot of YU people being mad, like, hold up, why are you yeah, here? Yeah. And hey, I could probably, <laughs> if I had a dollar by every time somebody asked me that, I'd be yeah. telling much money I would have. People like, no, we were walking through here? the conference center and Mike, Mike couldn't get to lunch because people were mad at him that he was at APAC and not the conference center. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to put a postscript. I know as we were watching, I believe, Senator Chuck Schumer on the big stage and Vice President Pence. Uh, Mike got a call and was like, listen, I got to get back. We're in the NCAA tournament. Um, we'll talk later. Coach needs me back to practice. So let's go to the next week. I think it was you're playing at John's uh, on the Hopkins campus. I forgot who you were actually playing. Um, what does that look like when Yeshiva University is on the road and Shabbat's about to happen and there's a game at 3 o'clock? What does that look like in real time? Um, it was kind of crazy. Um, it was one of those things. Um, it was one of those things, as I asked him, I was like, hey, guys, so what happens? I said, I'm not trying to jinx our team. So what, say, say we get to double or triple overtime, because, you know, at 3 o'clock game, it gets dark at 5 o'clock. So you have a short window to get a lot done. I said, so what happens if it goes in double overtime? He's like, do not say that. <laughs> I said, what are your decisions? He's like, yeah, we got to walk off. I said, we got to walk off the court. I was like, so you got to surrender your entry. He's like, yeah, you have to. So uh-huh. some of them were like, eh, I don't know. Well, I don't know about that one. So a lot of people was like on the fence, but I was like, it's a good scenario. Like, what do you do? So I think we were able to, I think because I brought that up, I think they were able to get it to two o'clock or one forty-five start or something. Oh, interesting. They were able wow. to switch the games. Mm-hmm. They were able to switch the games. It was an early game. It was like, well, Mike might have, you know, spoken into something that existed. I was like, yeah, I just want to know. But um, it was very interesting trying times. That's when the coronavirus pandemic kind of pretty much started. And, um, and go figure, we play at Hopkins, where Hopkins is obviously one of the main places where they do all these studies and all these numbers are coming from. So Hopkins is pretty, at first, it took us a lot to play that game. You know, the hotel we went to wouldn't accept us at first. The first right. hotel didn't accept us. Um, so we ended up finding a second hotel. But um, so Hopkins, luckily, we got to a point where they said, hey, you can play with no fans. But they didn't want us to come there because one of the, I guess, the coronavirus when it first started, yeah, that's one of the first people, one, yeah, one, of, one of the first people that got it in New York. The mm-hmm. son attended YU, so right, everybody right. at that time, everybody assumed that all of us had it. Right. So it was one of those things where you know, yeah, we had to play with no fans, and it was crazy because they had people on the side with like hazmat suits on, ready to spray the gym down. At it was, wow. it was a crazy trying times, but um, you know, it was a lot of fun. You know, I'm not gonna lie, it was a lot of fun. You know, we made the best of it. Um, a lot of bonding moments. You know, it was just us and you know, just no fans, no parents. We was just you know, all our team dinners were together. So it was a, it was a great time. I got to know people more on a you know, better level than I did. So it was an amazing right. time. And the second round was on Saturday night or Sunday? Uh, Friday, Saturday. Yeah, it was back-to-back games, back-to-back nights. So uh, well, actually, my mom just texted me saying, tell them no, the story. No, no, Yeah, it was, was it Saturday or Sunday? So how does, you know, usually like, uh, you know, a team wins and then they scout the next opponent, right? Mm-hmm. Well, all the coaches are eating their challah at Shabbat dinner. 
what does that yeah. look like? Are they saying, oh, Mike, you're going in and you go bring us the, it's like the spies in the Bible in the book of uh, yeah. uh, Numbers. <laughs> so were you that spy or how, how does that work? <laughs> it was, so it's funny. Um, I was a person that um, had to do, um, yeah, the scout report. I was like, I don't want this pressure, man. Like, this is a lot of pressure to put all this on me because I never did a scout report throughout the year. I was a person that could just <laughs> do the on course stuff, not come up with a game plan. So it was like, hey, you know, you have to watch the game and find out the winner of the game and tell us, you know, who's what, what's what. So it was a lot of fun. But um, a couple of guys were, I'm not saying names, a couple of guys were kind of just sneaking to see what I was watching, see those, they had the itch <laughs> to kind of just check, like, hey, I'm just coming to say hello, Mike. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience to, just to do that and just me just kind of, you know, and find out what was going to happen, like find out who was going to play. Because if I wasn't there, I guess they would find out. I don't know how they were going to find out who was going to play. Because then, right. you know. Yeah, I guess you have to ask somebody. I guess then you can ask somebody because then you're technically. So I don't know how they're going to do it. You really know your halacha, your Jewish law. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I like when you yeah. came to LA. You're asking all these uh, kosher questions. It's re- really funny. Um, yeah. And what about that 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 Shabbat, for instance? Was there a team meal? You know, what's the difference between a team meal and a Shabbat dinner after a game like that? Do they like yeah, so switch we had off? A- like we're done with basketball. We're doing the we're doing the blessing. What, what does that look like? Yeah, so after so after the game, everybody went to go change up and got dressed up and went straight to you know Shabbat dinner, uh-huh. and uh, so it was a normal you know normal Shabbat dinner and um, slash team meal. So we kind of combined everything, and um, it was just amazing, just amazing being a part of it. Like I said, for me, I just I love being a Shabbat dinner because you know for me, it's a you know time to kind of disconnect a little bit, um, and just for me, it's, it's I'm still learning to this day. I'm still learning. I'm so actually, but I try to drive people crazy because I ask so many questions. I, or I really want to learn. So I'm like if I'm around. Community, I want to be educated. I don't want to, yeah. you know, offend anybody. Of course, they say, "Oh, you won't be offensive," but I, I want to be offended. I don't want to be offensive. I want to know what's right. You know, even like I had to learn the hard way about shaking a woman's hand. You know, <laughs> some of those things. I just that's why I ask a lot of questions. I just I just want to know. And what about um, the aspect of Ramaz? Ramaz, you're, you're coaching a middle school girls team. I remember you came out here and you were like, "It's going to be a rough <laughs> year." And all of a sudden, I saw you last, and you're like, "They were in the playoffs." How did that happen? I actually remember, this is a funny story, if I may share. You came out here, you said it was home hospitality, um, and you showed up, and they thought one of the young players was showing at their house, and you were in a children's <laughs> den, 6'8", 260, sitting uh, in the Pico Robertson area. Um, so how did the Ramaz experience a, a middle school basketball? Now compare that to your upbringing basketball, Oxen Hill. What did you see, and what did you transform in that aspect as well? Um, for me, those, I mean, I had a girls team. So those, those girls, they pushed me, they, they pushed me in a way, brought some stuff out of me, they brought a lot of patience out of me. And, um, they were just amazing to coach this year. We started out 0-4. No, I'm sorry. We lost no, the games. We started out at first. We started 0-3. So started out 0-3 and then we lost the games we lost in California didn't count on the record. So technically we started out 0-6. And, um, so I was like, wow, this is going to be a long year because we just, <laughs> wasn't clicking at it was just, it was just all bad and i finally said you know what i'm going to make a change so i changed a few things to our offense changed a few things to our defense i switched up some lineups and um kind of just and i kind of had i think i think one thing i told them because what happened was the boys team was teasing the girls they was like hey you know you guys suck all oh, you guys are not bad so i actually pulled them to the side i was like look i'm being for real i know you guys because they, they would say the coach we suck coach we're not good i said look don't mm-hmm. say that to me i said because you know why I believe in you guys, no matter what you think. He's like, you're just saying, I said, no. I said, I feel like we're going to turn this around and I know we're going to do well. Mm-hmm. I said, we're going to, I said, we just fuck, do what we're supposed to do. We got to keep working. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to do this together. I said, don't, I said, don't ever say that you're, you know, don't tell it to me ever again. Mm-hmm. And I think that they, they, they tell me to this day, a couple of them wrote me, was like, you know, you really changed my mindset. Mm-hmm. And thank you for that. Cause I was like, no, I'm not going to let you think that. So it's funny. We end up, our girls ended up going on the winning streak and the boys ended up having the losing streak. <laughs> oh. So I was, I wanted to be like, hey, you might want to mess with them now, but no, I didn't do that. But it was funny, but um, they brought I think a lot what, of I, I think what you said um, really sums up what your life was about in the beginning, that perhaps nobody in those deepest moments said like, no, not that I, if I use your language, I suck, <laughs> right? But yeah. no, I, I can believe in myself, right? I can get through this. Um, not that I'm going to move on, but I can continue to move forward. And the same thing was told to these, a very different situation, but eighth grade girls on a basketball court, same thing is said to Yeshiva University, the same thing is said to Camper Ma, um, and finding that person, right? For you, it was your dad that always brought you along, but who is that person, that team, that community 
that's yeah. really going to bring you along as well. And I think we're seeing that as well right now, right? We're all stuck behind these screens, but yeah. <laughs> what connections and relationships are you going to then develop that will say like, I believe in you, we believe in ourselves and, you know, we're going to get to that point where we can, uh, we can take a, a step further as well. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, I just want to, if there are any questions on Facebook or YouTube to um, let us know and we'll get them answered here. We just have a few more moments left. Um, okay. Hopefully this is uh, both entertaining, but really in a better way. Um, I think Mike Sweeney is just deeply inspiring in terms of how he inspired so many people, not just on the court, but really nowadays off the court um, on different ages as well. Um, I think Mike's story is the high holiday sermon that we all are, uh, all looking for um, as well. So what do you see your, if you wish, basketball professional path going forward, um, your Jewish community involvement, and perhaps how do those come together um, moving forward? Um, I think for me, just moving forward, I just want to continue coaching, obviously. And I always tell people this, um, I'm so, I'm more happier in that piece now, doing what I'm doing now than I was playing in NBA. People think I'm crazy to say, I was like, no, like for me, just being a part of the Jewish community, um, feeling welcome, and, um, you know, having all the coaching opportunities and speaking and engagements, um, just learning so much about the community. And um, one thing I learned about the community that has really changed me, and I've kind of said this to my own friends and community, I was like, in the Jewish community, everybody's like sticks together. Everybody's always pushing one another and being here for another. And it's like no man left behind mentality. And I watched that and I learned that. And I was like, wow, this is something that I really need to take you know, to some of my friends and some of my community because, like, you know, it doesn't happen that way with us. And I'm just being honest. So that's one thing I've learned so much and I've been bringing it to my community and to my friends. And but I know, so for me, just to keep pushing forward, um, like, you know, speaking in the community, you know, and, you know, in, whether it's in the Jewish community, I was in the Jewish community, wherever it is, just continue to, just, you know, share my story, share my message, um, continue coaching basketball. Um, people ask me that I want to go coach a higher division one in the NBA right now. I said, well, right now I'm kind of at peace with it you know, why you are, um, Ramaz is, you know, it's comfortable from where I'm at right now. So something happens in the years, you know, if that, we'll see, but right now that's where I'm peaceful and comfortable at. I'm happy with it. I, I remember at the policy conference on Sunday night, I said, uh, you know, we, we saw this speaker and that speaker. And then I was like, uh, Mike, we're going to go to a reception with about uh, 500 rabbis right now. I remember <laughs> you walked in that room and the one day that they, they, they just saw you, but it was really inspiring knowing that they knew that story that has infiltrated our Jewish community of the effort. And I think what you said in the beginning, right? Um, not knowing a community and then taking that literal leap step into the community. Um, you keep mentioning the word trust in Tamir, but then trust into the community. Um, I know at Camp Ramah, you have such a great relationship with Rabbi Joel, Rabbi Seltzer, and that community as well. And your reputation now follows you because um, just as perhaps you might have needed our community, I think our community needs somebody like you to step up, be yes. open, honest, trustworthy. Um, and as I said, a high level of sports um, can be involved in our high level of community as well. So on a personal note, um, I just uh, <laughs> love chatting with you and seeing you. I love just our exchange of uh, conversation throughout the year as well. And I know when all this um, sort of goes away, we're going to be able to do some pretty amazing things uh, going For forward sure. as well. So real quick, but, so back yeah. to that, um, the rabbis. Um, from yeah. mention. So <laughs> when you told me about it, I didn't tell you this at the time, when you told me in my mind, like my heart, like I was uh. so scared. Because I was like, wow. Because like, you know, in the rabbis convention, I'm just, everybody's powerful. Everybody's, you know, in charge of the synagogue. Everybody's like on this, you know, higher pedestal. I'm like, wow, is he really bringing me in? Like, what am I about to do? So when I walked in there, it was so warm and people knew my story. So I felt, I think that was when I kind of felt like this acceptance type thing. I was like, wow, like nice. if they know my story, they accept me. This is an amazing feeling. And some of them already knew so much about me. So thank you for that. Because at that time, I was like, what is Aaron doing? Why is he bringing me in here? <laughs> but uh, it was an amazing experience, though. I, mean, I just, I learned, I had a lot of knowledge. I learned so much in there. Yeah, so thank no, you for I can, that. Uh... <laughs> And the food wasn't too shabby either, so it was good. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I made myself sick that day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, we want to thank Mike Sweetney, um, All-American high school player, Georgetown Hoya, three years, ninth pick of the NBA draft 2003, NBA veteran for the Knicks and the Bulls, but most importantly in our tradition, a mensch, just a truly good person that has the opportunity to share his story with us. And I hope that you all on uh, Facebook, YouTube, Sinai Land uh, will share his story and continue to be in touch. 
um, as we go uh, from strength to strength, strength to strength. So I want to thank Mike and uh, we hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you so right, much. Thank you so much, buddy. Appreciate it.